In this life, any punishment or tribulation fills mortals with fear and dread, merely because it affects the senses and brings them in close touch with it through them. But the guilt of sin does not affect them, nor fill them with dread. Men are entirely taken up by that which is visible, and they therefore do not look upon the ultimate consequences of sin, which is the eternal punishment of hell. Though this is imbibed and inseparably connected with sin, the human heart becomes so heavy and remiss that it remains as if it were stupefied in its wickedness, because it does not feel it present in its senses. Though it could see and feel it by faith, this itself remains listless and dead, as if it were wanting entirely. Almost unhappy blindness of mortals, O oh, torpid negligence that holds so many souls capable of reason and of glory oppressed in deceit. There are not words or sentences sufficient to describe this terrible and tremendous danger. My daughter, haste away and fly with holy fear such an unhappy state, and deliver thyself up to all the troubles and torments of life, which pass soon rather than incur such a danger, for nothing will be wanting to thee if thou do not lose God. To be convinced that there are no small faults for thee and for thy state is a powerful means of saving thyself. Fear greatly the small things, for in despising small faults the Most High knows that the human heart invites other greater ones. That is not a blameless love, which it does not avoid all displeasure of the beloved. The order which religious souls should maintain in their desires should be that they strive to be punctual in fulfilling the obligations of their vows and all the virtues which are connected with them. Afterwards, and secondarily, they may engage in voluntary practices such as are called supererogatory. This order, some of the souls, who are misled by the devil to entertain an indiscreet zeal for perfection, are wont to invert. Thus, while they fail seriously in the obligations of their state, they are eager to add other voluntary exercises and practices, which are usually of small use or benefit, or arise from a spirit of presumption and singularity. They secretly desire to be looked upon as distinguished in zeal and perfection, while in truth they are very far even from the beginning of perfection. I do not wish to see in thee a fault so reprehensible, but first fulfill all the duties of thy vows and of community life, and then thou mayest add what thou canst, according to thy ability and the inspiration of divine grace. This together will beautify thy soul and will make it perfect and agreeable in the eyes of God. The vow of obedience is the principal one in religion, for it implies a total renunciation and denial of one's will. By it, the religious renounces all jurisdiction or right to say for himself, I will or I will not, I shall or I shall not act. All this he throws aside and renounces by obedience, delivering himself into the hands of his superior. In order to fulfill this obligation, it is necessary for thee not to be wise in thy own conceit, not to imagine thyself still mistress of thy likings, thy desires, or thy opinion for true obedience must be of the quality of faith so that the commands of the superior are esteemed reverenced and put into execution without any pretense of examination or criticism accordingly in order to obey thou must consider thyself without opinion without life of thy own without right of speech but thou must allow thyself to be moved and governed like a corpse alive only in order to execute devotedly all that the superior desires. Never discuss within thyself whether thou shouldst fulfill his commands or not, 
but only consider how thou canst best execute that which is commanded. Sacrifice thy own inclination and repress all thy appetites and passions. And when by this efficacious determination thou art dead to all the movements of self, let obedience be the soul and the life of thy works. To the will of thy superior thou must conform all thy own. With all its activity in all thy words and works, let it be thy prayer to be able to quit thy own being and receive another new one, so that nothing be thine and all in thee be of obedience without contradiction or resistance. Remember that the most perfect manner of obeying is to avoid offending the superior by showing that you disagree with him. He should find a willing obedience, convincing him that his commands are obeyed promptly, without objection or murmur, either in words or by any other signs. The superiors take the place of God, and he who obeys his superiors obeys the Lord himself. Who is in them and governs them and enlightens them, so that their commands will be for the salvation of souls. The contempt shown to superiors passes on to God himself, who through them manifests and makes known his will. Thou must persuade thyself that the Lord moves them to speak, and that it is the word of the Omnipotent himself. My daughter, strive to be obedient in order that thou mayest speak of victories. Do not fear to obey, for that is the secure path, so secure that God will not bring to account the errors of the obedient on the day of judgment, but he will rather blot out other sins in consideration of the sacrifice made in obedience. My most holy son offered his precious sufferings and death in special love for the obedient and procured for them special rights in regard to mercy and grace and special privileges towards the success and perfection of all that is due under obedience. Even now, in order to appease him, he reminds the Eternal Father of his obedience unto death and unto the cross and so the father is placated toward men. Because he was pleased with the obedience of Abraham and his son Isaac, he held himself obliged not only to save Isaac from death, who showed himself so obedient, but to make him the ancestor of the incarnate word, and to designate him as the head and beginning of the great blessings.